I had the brass ring and I tossed it aside. I let go. My parents were lifelong educators, my only brother, my only sister, lifelong educators. And among them, only I reached the apex of the educational world. I was a tenured full professor by the time I was 40. And I walked away when I was 49. I walked away from a job I loved, an act that made most people think I am insane. <laughs> and I'm not going to rule that out. <laughs> but I want to tell you my side of the story, at least. For many years, I was a classroom conservative. I taught my dog to whistle. That's what a classroom conservative does. It's the sage on the stage. I teach, obviously, you must be learning. <laughs> I received numerous accolades and awards for teaching, advising. Um, I was beloved by my students. I discovered early on that students don't care what you know until they know that you care about them. And so I was a caring professor. Here are the final lines of a book that was published that I wrote shortly before my departure. Quote, the rewards are supreme. You are allowed to live a life of leisure in the historical sense. You choose the work you do. Through the lives of your students, you experience life and death and the wonderful emotional roller coaster of youth. As such, you can choose to remain forever young, if only vicariously. You have opportunities to serve as a mentor, and if you are worthy and fortunate, somebody might endow you with that noblest of distinctions by calling you teacher. My dog never did learn to whistle. <laughs> and that taught me something important. Even earnest, caring teaching doesn't necessarily learn, lead to learning. The sage on the stage is dead. So too is the model of student as customer in a business-driven enterprise. Most university administrators did not realize that that model has been dead for decades. So I switched my approach to one based on a core of discovery. In my classroom, we are a core of discovery. We all have something to contribute. And all contributions are welcome. I took a liberal approach to teaching. Liberal in the, in the context of broad, and also liberal in that I put everything on the line, everything I knew, and everything I was for every meeting of every class. How can you learn otherwise? How can you test your own assumptions if you don't expose them? Six years ago, a student noticing that my approach was strange wrote down a few phrases that we brought up in the first few minutes of class. And so this is a class on wildland vegetation management. We're speaking specifically about conspicuous consumption. And we talked about all of the following within the first three or four minutes of class. And it all fit. It all hung together. The list, which I keep to this day with me, because I find it so intriguing that somebody would write down anything I was talking about, <laughs> much less find out unusual. The, the list included the Princess Bride, Pangea, no Child Left Behind, Charlton Heston, Sheryl Crow, John Dewey, the educational philosopher, <coughs> the New Jersey Turnpike, Socrates, Espresso Art, which is a local coffee shop in Tucson, and a culvert under Speedway Boulevard. Well before this, in the middle of my career, I had become an accidental social critic. There was a small patch of Sonoran Desert left on the campus of the University of Arizona, smaller than this room. The remnants of what used to be a mile-long stretch several hundred yards wide, up until 1970, it was huge. And there are historical pictures in the University of Arizona archives of students out botanizing in this magnificent cactus patch and students doing art in this magnificent cactus patch. People learning about the natural world and learning from the natural world. And so, of course, by the late 1980s, that patch was reduced to a piece smaller than this room. The university administration hired a San Francisco-based design firm to fix the campus. And their first recommendation was to get rid of that ugly piece of desert. <laughs> so I went on a campaign <coughs> of one. And I wrote letter after letter and message after message to the university president. And he ignored them all. Finally, in frustration, 
I sent the letter to the local daily newspaper, thinking they would run it as a news story. I mean, batshit crazy professor has an idea. <laughs> President might be stupid. You know, this is the headline I envisioned. <laughs> it's not the headline they ran. <laughs> but they did run it as an op-ed piece, as a guest commentary. They just edited a few things and made it sound as if I was writing it to the university president as an open letter. Suddenly, the university president was answering my every call. <laughs> and he wasn't in a good mood, either. <laughs> my my the students in my class one day made a bunch of signs. I did not encourage this, I swear. And went out and, and, and marched around the little patch of cactus. Right? So this is 15 years ago, and we're back in the 1960s all over again. And we saved the little patch of desert. Of course, we got the red brick pavers and the fountains to go with it. The fountains have been turned off now because the Great Recession ensures that we don't have enough money to turn on fountains anymore in the desert. Gee, I never could have seen that coming. <laughs> in the latter years of my career, I was doing the best and most important work of my life. By this time, of course, I was banned from teaching in my home department because students were learning to question the dominant paradigm. So I taught through a program called Poetry Inside Out. In Poetry Inside Out, inside, is the men's pods of the Pima County Jail and the girls' pods of the Pima County Juvenile Detention Facility. Out is an alternative high school in which a vast majority of the Hispanic students have been kicked out of three or four conventional high schools. And the fourth leg was my honors class. I was still allowed to teach through the honors college because the honors dean had almost nobody willing to teach an honors class, so she was sort of desperate. And she was willing to expose honor students to those wacky ideas of mine, thinking the students might just be able to sort them out. So I've been ha I was having lunch with a retired colleague one day, and the time sort of got away from me. And I looked at my watch and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go teach poetry in prison. And he says, oh, is that what they're calling it now? <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm teaching poetry in prison. Uh, to this day, I don't think he got that. I would require all of my honor students to go into the detention facility at, one, at least once each semester. And when we came out, after about two hours of upper middle class white students interacting with Latina losers, we would ask just one question. What did you think? And so now for two hours, these upper middle class white students have been exposed to students who are almost their age, typically two years difference between them. Um, these girls had been abused in every conceivable way, most recently sexually by their mother's current boyfriend. They were substance abusers. They had been knifed or shot at or both. They had had friends die in their arms. And we would ask that one question, what did you think? And the honor student said it was almost unanimous. They're just like me. they could see that the similarities of the human experience so overwhelmed the differences as to make the differences unimportant. By this time, my teaching was inclusive, and it led to real learning, to learning that matters, to the idea that empathy might be important. I think that's actually the most important thing people can learn, and I don't know how to teach it, but we can create environments that allow for empathy to emerge. I think that's about the best we can hope for. Well before this point, my scholarship had broadened to include the twin sides of the fossil fuel coin, and my message increasingly targeted the public paying my salary. Long a conservation biologist, I had become a friend of the earth, as well as a social critic, and I'd come to recognize the costs and consequences of the industrial economy, obedience at home, oppression abroad, and wholesale destruction of every aspect of the living planet. As Erin Dottie Roy writes in her 2001 book, Power Politics, quote, the trouble is that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable, end quote. So I was accountable. I couldn't unsee what, what the age of industry was doing. And I had to do something. I was doing exceptional work, I was doing it well. 
obviously it was time to leave. I could no longer expose the dark underbelly of Western civilization and stay at the apex of empire. Tucson, Arizona is the apex of empire. Tucson, Arizona imports its water 335 miles across the desert uphill. It imports all its food, all the fossil fuels for heating and cooling. There's no sense of community. It's the suburban nightmare writ large. It is the apex of empire. I could no longer live there and expose the dark underbelly of the way we live. So a few years ago, I, I wrote, I put my own spin on it. Big energy poisons our water. Big ag controls our seeds, hence our food. Big farm controls through pharmaceuticals the behavior of our children. Wall Street controls the flow of money. Big ad controls the messages you receive every day. The criminally rich get richer through crime. That's how America works. Through it all, we think we're free. By this time, I came to view the brass ring as the monkey trap. Perhaps you're familiar with the monkey trap. You, you take a, a basket and you attach it to the ground. The basket has a hole just lar large enough that a monkey can stick its, its hand in the hole. And it's got a piece of fruit in the monkey trap. The monkey reaches in, grabs the piece of fruit, and now the hand won't come out. But the monkey won't let go. The brass ring was the monkey trap, and I let go. Like most contemporary Americans, I was bound by the monkey trap for a very long time, much longer than I should have been. It was very challenging to let go. I left the easy, overpaid life of the university for four reasons. I believe there's a moral imperative to the way we live our lives, and the apex of empire ain't it. It's inconsistent with the moral imperative, I feel. I left as an act of resistance. I was born in 1960 and came of age in a period of resistance that almost overnight gave way to, if we just have a few dollars more, we can ignore all that. I wanted to have more time to write and speak. And fourth and least important, I wanted to have the potential to add a few more years to my life, although I suspect that that is a moot point. As Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. At this point, it's a race. This physical life is just killing me. We'll see. I continue to teach at what I call Barefoot College. I've hosted more than 300 people in the last two years, and I continue to write at a blog called Nature Bats Last. I continue to take advantage of these opportunities when they arise. That's not to say I don't miss many aspects of my former life. I miss daily interaction with my best friend of three decades, who has chosen another path. I miss weekly interactions with inmates and honor students. I miss fingers that open and close on command. Man, that's great. When you don't have the edema and the arthritis, it's like you can push the electrons around on the screen all day and you never encounter that problem. But a shovel? That's work. I miss civilization even knowing what it does to the living planet. The aching in my heart is profound, not to mention the aching in my fingers, but they pale in comparison to the heartache I feel when I think about civilization. Civilization forces us further into human population overshoot every day. Civilization forces us into obedience at home and oppression abroad. Civilization forces us, at least Western civilization and its apex, the industrial economy, forces us to drive more than 100 species to extinction every single day. And then there's anthropogenic climate change. It is ratcheting up at such a profound rate, it looks like we're headed for our own extinction unless we terminate the industrial economy relatively soon. So I miss all those things, but I could never go back, and not just because I'd never be hired into a civilized job because of that whole insanity thing. <laughs> now I share a small property with a small family of humans, as well as goats, ducks, chickens, and gardens. I'm living in agrarian anarchy in a community based on gift exchange. I've taken responsibility for myself and for my neighbors, and those neighbors are human and otherwise. Like a Cheyenne dog soldier, I have placed my picket pen at the edge of empire in this small valley. 
I will protect this valley even with my life from further insults, including the proposed dam. The problem with being a martyr, you have to die for the cause. But as we all know, birth, birth is lethal. Finally, very late in an unexamined life, I came to see the horrors of the way we live, and I let it go. And I invite you to join me. Thank you. <laughs>